and I can I think I can speak for Crystal and say that we are happy and blessed that that you didn't disregard us because of my age or my <laughs> lack of experience. That, uh, that we are truly blessed to be here, and, and as there may be a, a double portion of honor upon the role of pastor and elder, it, it, there's also this great responsibility to that I feel every time I step up here, just to to not speak on my knowledge or my experience, but but to come to you with nothing but the Word of God, and and I pray that if I ever stop doing that, that just as quickly as you call me, that you will that you will get rid of me. And so, uh, because people come and people go, but God's word remains the same, and that is that is what I believe every church uh, needs. And so, we are thankful uh, to be here to be a part of you. And as we're going to see this morning, I believe the future is bright for Salem Baptist Church. That, that God is not done with us. That there are things in the future uh, that He is going to use us for His glory. And so, uh, and so with that, and also. Talking about God's glory, I forgot to also mention that our Reach Texas offering, we that is still going. I believe we're at 2850? 2785. 2785. Yeah. And so we are we are very close to our goal of 3000 And thank you again for those who have already given. And, and knowing that every dollar of that is going to go to churches who are uh, being planted, to churches who are being revitalized, to churches... Uh, who may not be planted yet, but they're trying to get a church planter or a pastor in place. That, that every dollar of that is going to spread the gospel and spread the kingdom of God, not across the world, but right here in Texas. And so, as we saw, San Marcos, San Antonio, that all across our state, there's still such a need. 60% of people are without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ in our state alone. Uh, so again, that, that is still all open for the next few few weeks here. But I do invite you to go ahead and turn with me to Daniel chapter 11. We're going to look at, um, continue working through the, uh, the last vision that Daniel received, the last revelation. And as we, as we began it last week, we saw that, that really about half of this, a little more than half of this chapter for us is history. It's looking back at things that have already been accomplished. But today, about halfway through, we're going to shift our focus from looking back at things that have happened to looking forward to, to things that are still yet to come. So this morning, we get to be in the position like Daniel, and we are waiting for the final revelation that, that we're going to see here in, in the first in the last verses of chapter 11 and the first few verses of, of chapter 12. And so we know that, as we've seen, that, that Israel had faced persecution. That, But as we're going to see this morning, that one day that persecution, and really in many cases across the world that already has, shifted not just persecuting the nation of Israel, but persecuting the church, that all who call on the name of of Jesus, But again, I believe that the future is gloriously bright. You know, about three quarters of the way through this message, you may be saying, okay, Brad, where's the, where's the bright spot here? But as a believer in Jesus Christ, our future is gloriously bright. As the church of Jesus Christ, our future is gloriously bright. Jesus promised that he would build his church and that the gates of hell would not overcome it, would not prevail against it. And so we have the promise from Jesus himself that no matter what we see, the future is gloriously bright for our church. And because we as Salem Baptists are a part of that global church, again, I believe our future for Salem is bright as well. And so I'm going to go ahead and read Daniel chapter 11 and start in verse 21. It says, In his place a despised person will arise. Royal honors will not be given to him, but he will come during a time of peace and seize the kingdom by intrigue. And a flood of forces will be swept away before him. They will be broken, as well as the covenant prince. And after an alliance is made with him, he will act deceitfully. He will rise to power with a small nation. And during a time of peace, he will come into the richest parts of the province and do what his fathers and predecessors never did. He will lavish plunder, loot, and wealth on his followers. And he will make plans against fortified cities, but only for a time. 
And with a large army, he will stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south. And the king of the south will prepare for battle with an extremely large and powerful army, but he will not succeed because plots will be made against him. Those who eat his provisions will destroy him. Will destroy him. His army will be swept away, and many will fall slain. The two kings whose hearts are bent on evil will speak lies at the same table, but to no avail, for still the end will come at the appointed time. And the king of the north will return to his land with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant, and he will take action and then return to his own land. And at the appointed time, he will come again to the south, but this time will not be like the first. Ships of Kittim will come against him, and being intimidated, he will withdraw. Then he will rage against the Holy Covenant and take action on his return. He will favor those who abandon the Holy Covenant. His forces will rise up and desecrate the temple fortress. They will abolish the regular sacrifice and set up the abomination of desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who act wickedly toward the covenant. But the people who know their God will be strong and take action. Those who have insight among the people will give understanding to many, yet, that, yet many, yet they will fall by the sword and flame and be captured and plundered for a time. And when they fall, they will be helped by some, but many others will join them insincerely. Some of those who have insight will fall so that they may be refined, purified, and cleansed until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. And then the king will do whatever he wants. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god, and he will say outrageous things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, because what has been decreed will be accomplished. He will not show regard for the gods of his fathers, the gods desired by women, or any other god, because he will magnify himself above all. Instead, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god that his fathers did not know, with gold, silver, precious stones, and riches. He will deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god, and he will greatly honor those who acknowledge him, making them rulers over many and distributing the land as a reward. And at the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle, but the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. He will invade countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land, and many will fall. But these will escape from its power. Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of the Ammonites. He will extend his power against the countries, and not even the land of Egypt will escape. He will get control over the hidden treasures of gold, silver, and over all the riches of Egypt. The Libyans and Cushites will also be in submission. But reports from the east and the north will terrify him, and he will go out with great fury to annihilate and completely destroy many. He will pitch his royal tents between the sea and the beautiful holy mountain. But he will meet his end with no one to help him. We're going to stop there for now. We're going to come back and look at the first three verses of chapter 12 as well. But over and over again, we see this theme of time being brought up here in this passage. The appointed time, the time of the end, until that time. And it's, it's important to understand because that, give, that should give us hope because we know the one in whose who holds time in his hands. We know the timekeeper. But as we live our lives and as we look forward, we, we also have to remember that oftentimes our, our timetable doesn't line up with God's timetable. I mean, think about a time when you, when, you were, when you bought something, whether you ordered it in a catalog or ordered it online. You know, you, you looked at it, you researched it, you compared it with other products, you read the reviews, and then one day everything kind of lines up. Like you see it online, it's it's 50% off, it's got free shipping, and you decide, all right, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna pull the trigger, and you order it. But then you have to wait, right? The, the free shipping, they didn't necessarily tell you, it was gonna take two weeks, whereas you could pay and get it there in a couple of days. 
So you've got to wait for it to arrive. But then finally one day you hear the doorbell ring, and there it is. Your precious package arrives. But you open it up only to find that it's completely disassembled. You have to put it all together. The user manual's in 20 different languages, and it's in this itty-bitty tiny font that nobody can read. But finally, with a little perseverance, you, you get it all put together. But we know that it wasn't instant gratification. It might be easy to click a button on a computer and they take your money right then, but, but the product, fully assembled, it, it takes time to come to fulfillment. And I think that's how God, God is with us, that what he said in his word is true. We can bank on it. We can believe it. But before, for it to become fully fulfilled in our eyes, sometimes we have to be patient. And, and this passage is going to tell us, okay, how, what can we do in the meantime? What can we do to be prepared? What can we do to have faith to endure? And so talking about time, I want us to see our first point this morning, and that is that until the appointed time, God allowed his people to be persecuted. That may seem kind of harsh, but until the appointed time, God allowed his people to be persecuted. You know, we left off last week in verse 20 with Antiochus III's son. He was in power briefly. He sent out his tax collector who failed and came back and actually poisoned him. And then we pick up in verse 21, it says, A despised person will arise. Now this is Antiochus III's other son, Antiochus IV. And we've heard about him from back in chapter 8, where he's the little horn who, who wants to destroy God's people, and not just destroy God's people, but destroy worship of God. He desecrated the temple. Verse 27 tells us that his heart was bent on evil, that he's seeking to destroy God's people and God's worship. Now down in verse, verse 31, it says, They will abolish the regular sacrifice and set up the abomination of desolation. And so during his reign, he killed 80,000 Jewish people. Think about that. 80,000 Jewish people he murdered simply because they worshipped Yahweh. And then he desecrated the temple. He turned it into a temple to worship Zeus. And on December 6th, he set up a, an idol of Zeus in the temple. And 10 days later, he offered all kinds of sacrifices, including pigs, on the Jewish altar to the God of Zeus. He proclaimed himself as God. We mentioned that, that he gave himself a nickname, God Manifest. He wanted everyone to know his name and to worship him. But we also see in verse 30 that his power was limited, thankfully, that at the appointed time, God put an end to his power. It says, ships of Kittim will come against him, and being intimidated, he will withdraw. And so this is, this is the Roman Empire sending their navy to combat some of the things that he was doing. And history tells us that this the commander of the Roman fleet, he came out to meet him, and he, and he gave him an ultimatum. He said, you can either withdraw, and we will leave you alone, or you can continue persecuting and destroying, and you're going to be attacked by the Roman Empire. And then this commander, he took out his sword, and he drew a circle in the sand around Antiochus IV. And he said, whatever you do, decide before you step out of that circle. And so wisely, he decided to withdraw. And so we know that even killing 80,000 people, even desecrating God's temple, eventually his appointed time came. His power was limited. We know verse 35 tells us that until the time of the end. I'll just read the whole verse. It says, some of those who have insight will fall, so that they may be refined, purified, and cleansed until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. So even with all the terrible things he did, his power and his time in power was limited. And now in verse 36, we shift our attention from looking back to things that were accomplished before Jesus' first coming. Now we're shifting our attention to to the things that are going to happen right before Jesus returns the second time. And our second point, it's very similar to the first, but it's until the appointed time, 
God will allow his people to be persecuted. And again, you might be saying, where's the bright spot in that? Nobody wants persecution. Nobody likes the idea of being persecuted for our faith. <laughs> but listen to verse 36. It says, then the king will do whatever he wants. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god. And he will say outrageous things against the god of gods. So as we're going to see later on, that this is shifting from Antiochus IV to a revelation of the Antichrist who is still yet to come. And I believe that Antiochus IV, in many ways, he was, a, he was a, a foretaste of what the Antichrist will come. He exalted himself above every other god. He wanted people to worship him. He desecrated the temple. He killed God's people. And we know from Revelation and from, from this passage in Daniel that the Antichrist will come and do the same thing. He's going to exalt himself and blaspheme God. But verse 38 tells us that, unlike Antiochus, that he's, not gonna, he's going to disregard every other god. The Antichrist isn't going to worship Zeus or any other so-called god. He's only going to worship himself and what it tells us is the God of fortresses or the God of war. The only thing on his mind, the only thing on his heart is absolute destruction and world domination. Verse 41 tells us that he's also going to invade the beautiful land and many will fall. He will terrorize and persecute and kill God's people. Like Antiochus' heart was set on evil, verse 44 tells us that the Antichrist's heart will be completely evil and set on destruction. It says, reports from the east and the north will terrify him. He will go out with great fury to annihilate and to completely destroy many. That's the only thing that he's going to care about is destruction, domination, and having every person on the planet bow down and worship him. We saw in, in Daniel 1 and 2 that Nebuchadnezzar, he builds this statue and he, he wants everyone in the nation to bow down and, and worship that statue. Well, when we fast forward to the end times, we know that that's not going to be isolated. That's going to be worldwide. That this figure is going to want everyone, not just in Babylon, not just in certain countries and cities, but everyone in the entire world to bow down and to worship him. You can flip over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. We'll see how the Holy Spirit describes the Antichrist in the New Testament. He said, He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he sits in God's temple, proclaiming that he himself is God. That sounds like Paul could be reading Daniel chapter 11. That here's this figure who, who cares nothing about anyone but himself. He wants only to be worshipped. He blasphemes God. He gets rid of all other forms of worship. And he proclaims that he himself is God. But again, we have the good news that also, just as Antiochus' power was limited and his time came to an end, we also have the promise looking forward that the Antichrist's reign and power will also be limited. Look at verse 36 back in Daniel chapter 11. The very same verse that talks about him coming to power and exalting himself above every other God and blaspheming God. The end of the verse says he will be successful until... He will be successful. God will allow the Antichrist to persecute God's people, but only for a time, until the time of wrath is completed. The Antichrist isn't in control of that power any more than Antiochus IV or any other terrible figure who lived throughout history and wanted to destroy God's people. All of their power and time and power has been limited by God. And it will be no different for the Antichrist. And if you flip over to verse 45, it says he will pitch his royal tents between the sea and the beautiful holy mountain. But 
he will meet his end with no one to help him. This is the Antichrist. He will meet his end with no one to help him. This time it's not going to be a Roman commander drawing a circle in the sand and saying withdraw or face the Roman Empire. This time it's going to be Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the living God, coming on the clouds. And look back to 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 to see how the battle goes. Paul said the Lord Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth. Think about that. There's no battle. There's no campaign. There's no long, drawn-out war. The Lord Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth, and he will bring him to nothing at the appearance of his coming. He's got worldwide domination. He's set up for the final battle, and Jesus Christ comes on the clouds, and at the appearance of his coming, the Antichrist is resolved to nothing. He's completely destroyed with the breath of his mouth, the word of God, the spirit of God, and the son of God. And the Antichrist is no match, for he is a mere man. What can man do against God? And if you're still in 2 Thessalonians, just look back up to verse 3. It says, he is a man doomed to destruction. So even as Paul is writing about all these terrible things that he will do, before he tells that, he says, but he is a man. He's doomed to destruction. As Daniel is receiving this revelation of all the terrible things that are both going to happen to the nation of Israel, God's people, a few hundred years in the future, and then who knows how long into the future with the Antichrist. But we have the promise, and that's where the bright spot comes in, that these are men who are doomed to destruction. And so the bright spot is our, our third point, and that is that at the appointed time, God will complete salvation. At the appointed time, God will bring salvation to complete fulfillment. While it's available to everyone on the planet now, there will come a day when salvation is complete. Jesus will return and make everything perfect. There will be perfect peace. And we as believers will reign with him forever and ever. And so, you know, if you will turn back to Daniel, we're going to look at chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And again, it starts off with, at that time, again, keep in mind that God is completely in control of time. Whether it's our time, the past, the present, the future, he is in control of it all. And he says, at that time, Michael, the great prince, who's, prince who stands watch over your people, will rise up. There will be a time of dis distress such as never has occurred since nations came into being until that time. But at that time, all your people who are found written in the book will escape. Many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life and some to disgrace and eternal contempt. Those who have insight will shine like the bright expanse of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Endeavor. So we know that the final resurrection is coming. What Jesus started when he rose from the grave himself, he ascended into heaven and he said, just the same way I returned, just the same way I left, I will return. We know that there is a future resurre resurrection. It will be the final resurrection. And we also were, were faced with a simple choice. He says, everyone whose name is found in the book, the, the Lamb's book of life, will escape. And so the question, the first question for us is, do you know for sure that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life? Have you given your life to Jesus to be your only Savior? He's the only one who has total dominion. He's the only one who has power over 
death. He has power over sin. It is your name written in the book of life. Now God is giving Daniel a clear, a clear picture of the choice that every person who ever lived has had. And that's the choice of we're all going to be raised. The question is, is, well, some get to be raised again and some don't. No, that's not the issue. Everyone's going to be raised again. But the issue is, where do you go when you are raised again? You will either be raised to disgrace, to an eternity in hell, or you will be raised to an eternity shining with Jesus Christ and God and His Spirit forever and ever in heaven. And so with that question, I know many of you, you know for sure that your name is in that book. You know your eternal destiny. But there's also some things that we can do in the meantime. We can't just say, well, you know, I know for sure that I am saved and then just kind of float through life without thinking about it or without doing anything. Now, Daniel also, or God, he calls us how to respond in this passage. And so flip back to chapter 11, verse 32. We're going to see three things here that I believe we can all apply. In the middle of that verse, it says, But the people who know their God will be strong and take action. This is in the midst of that persecution. And so even as the persecution is going on, even as Antiochus is killing 80,000 people, and even as the Antichrist is waging war on the earth, there's still a response for the people of God. And the first thing we have to do is to know God. It says the people who know their God. And so the first way to be prepared for whatever this world throws at us is to know God. Do you know him personally? Do you know him deeply? You know, we've, Dennis and Jim have been helping me redo our fence in the backyard and right in the middle of our yard there's this tree that somebody cut down but it's just kind of an eyesore and you walk in and you stump your toe on it so I've been trying to cut it up and burn it and cut it and burn it just to kind of get it down and the more we dig around and even as we dug some post holes for uh, a little shade sale we keep every, everywhere we go we keep finding these roots and this dead tree that's cut all the way just a couple of inches above ground, it still has this massive root system that's all over our backyard. Every time we dig a hole, we find another root. And that's how our lives should look. Do you know God in a deep way? That even when the world wants to blow and cut and, and tear you down, that that, that root system is so strong. We're, we're called to know God personally, and we're called to know Him deeply. Then we also have to trust in His plan. To trust that no matter what happens, we know the timekeeper. We know that no matter what persecution we may face, what difficulties we may face, we know that they are limited in their time and in their power. Just as Job was, or as, as Satan was limited when he was attacking Job, the same thing is true for us who are in Christ. We know God. We know him deeply. We can trust his plan. And then we finally want to faithfully wait for his salvation. More than waiting on a package to come, we have to faithfully believe and, and wait and believe that this final resurrection, this, this complete salvation is coming. You know, God has brought people through persecution time and time again all throughout history, and we have to have the faith that if and when it happens here, that God will do it again, that he will bring us through just as he did so many others before us. And look at verse 35. There's a bright spot even in death. It says, some of those who have insight will fall. So God, it's a promise. It's, it's decreed that some believers are going to die from persecution. We see that all around the world. We talk about stories that we know and that we hear about. People will die because of persecution. People are dying because of persecution. 
But even in death, God gets the final word. Look at what happens. It says, some of those who have insight will fall. Why? So that they may be refined, purified, and cleansed until the time of the end. And so even in death, God is purifying you. God is refining you. God is cleansing you to make you more like himself. Think about Jesus when he died on the cross. He was beaten to a pole. So much so that people couldn't recognize him. He went into the grave. And on the third day, he rose again. But what did he look like when he came out of the grave? He was purified and refined and cleansed. So much so that he said, told his disciples, don't even touch me. I'm starting to put on my heavenly body. I and mean, think about and me and Crystal, we joke and we, we wake up and it's like, man, my knee hurts today or my back hurts. And a few years ago, I, I could go play basketball for hours and wake up and do it again the next day. But now it's like age is catching up with us. But think about, think about dying and, and all of that pain, all of those aches and pains are going to be refined and purified and cleansed out of us. We know that's true. We believe that. But so, so, so is our spirit. Just as the aches and the pains and the cancer and whatever else that's ailing us will one day be no more. Also on the inside, the temptations, the lust, the pride, the selfishness. God is through death. He's refining and purifying and cleansing us and preparing us to spend an eternity with him. So not even in death does the enemy get the last word. God has so much power and complete power over it that through it, he, just as he did with his son Jesus, he's making us more like himself. And so we don't have to fear persecution. It's not a question of if, but it's only a question of when. So many countries all across the world are already facing that decision. But we don't have to fear it. But trust in God. Know him deeply and trust in his plan. Then it says, the people who know their God will be strong. So the second point of application is to be strong in faith. Standing firm, it, it takes strength. Rely on the strength of God. That, you know, right now in America, the day hasn't come for us like it did for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to say, okay, you're going to bow down to this idol or we're going we're gonna to kill you. But that day is coming. And for us to be able to stand firm, for you to be able to stand firm and say, no matter what you threaten me with and no matter what you do to me, I am not going to bow down to anyone other than God. That takes firmness. That takes being strong. And for Daniel, knowing that what awaited him with the lion's den, and we see some of that now even in our culture, it's, it's okay to be a person of faith. Just be quiet about it. Don't tell anybody else. Don't worship. It's okay to have your beliefs, but don't let them affect the way that you live. We see that going on in our nation now. And that's really what Daniel was faced with. The, the, the choice for him wasn't to deny God. It was simply not to pray to anybody other than the king for 30 days. It's like, you don't have to deny your God. Just don't, don't read your Bible. Don't pray. Don't tell anybody about him for 30 days. But what did Daniel do? He goes to his room and, and three times a day, just as he did before, he prays and he worships God. Because that's who he was. That was in him. His, his faith was rooted so deep that for him, he could not be a person of faith in God without living out that faith. But what about us? What about you and me when we're faced with that decision of just shut up and be quiet or we're going to persecute you or we're going to kill you? To stand firm in those times, it takes strength. And God and his, his love for us, he's shown us that this is coming. That it's happened before and it's going to happen again. And then finally it says, they will know their God, be strong, and take action. 
So we've got to know God. We've got to be strong in that knowledge and faith. And then finally, we have to take action. So how do we take action? You know, we've, we've mentioned the idea of perseverance, that we persevere through different things, that God gives us, and he calls us to persevere through different things and for different things in different times in our lives. But as we're going to see here in Daniel 11 and 12, that the call here is to persevere by proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Persevere by sharing the good news. Look at verse 33. It says, those who have insight among the people will give understanding to many. It's like, we're the, that's us. We have the insight. We have God's revelation. We know that everybody on earth is going to be raised either to heaven with God forever or to hell. And so he says, those with insight give that understanding to many. The way that we take action is, is knowing God, believing in Him, trusting in His plan, being strong, and persevering through sharing the gospel. That's, I think that's the biggest way to fight against persecution. And we heard some stories like that with, with the terrible things that ISIS did. And they're beheading people simply for being affiliated with the Christian faith. But some of their prisoners were asking if they could pray for their persecutors. What a testimony. I mean, goodness. Fight persecution by never stopping proclaiming the good news of God. We see it again in chapter 12. It says in verse 3, Those who have insight will shine like the bright expanse of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. What a verse. Another way, and some of your translations may even um, translate the word inside as wise. God considers those who share the gospel as wise. And God rewards those who share the gospel by shining like the stars forever and forever. I mean, what a promise. I'm thinking about promises with stars. Think back all the way to Genesis chapter 15, verse 5. It's God told Abraham, he said, look at the sky and count the stars if you're able to count them. Your offspring will be that numerous. So from the beginning of history... God's telling Abraham, there's going to come a day when your descendants, when my people are more numerous than the stars. And now God is telling Daniel, if you, if you share the love of Christ with others, you are going to be like the very stars that you outnumber. I mean, what a promise. If you want to be famous in God's kingdom, share the gospel. He considers... Everyone who proclaims Christ is wise. Solomon said the same thing. I can, he said, the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. So persevere. Take action by proclaiming the gospel and leading many to righteousness. Right now we're, we're going through a, a, a prayer guide of 40 days of prayer. So I just ask you, as you're praying for God to, to breathe life into our church, pray that he would put somebody on your heart that you know doesn't know them. And again, just start with prayer. Cry out to God for that person that he would change their heart. But there is work for us to do. You know, what a tragedy it would be for some of your friends and relatives and people you used to work with or your neighbors, which we found out today in Sunday school neighbors isn't just next door neighbors it's anyone we have contact with what a tragedy it would be for them to be raised up on the last day only to spend eternity in hell when they could be shining with jesus forever and forever now let me close with this with this story there was a train conductor who on his last day he was going to retire but on his last day he's at work he's he's going through his normal routine He's going from car to car, punching the tickets of the passengers that were riding. And, and he comes to one person who knew him. Again, this guy rode the train mostly every day. They had a, uh, just a cordial relationship. And the passenger asked him, he says, 
how do you feel? This is your last day, right? And the conductor, he takes a deep breath and he, he pushes his cap back and he says, you know, it feels great. Because all my life, I've been working to lead people home. And what if that was true for us? That let's spend our lives working to lead people home to righteousness. Let me pray for us this morning.